All right, thanks, Amanda. That, that's recording now. Good afternoon. I'll just start. It is not known when Carol and McDonald met, much less when they started discussing each other's works. The earliest time specified for the meeting is, according to Doherty, 1858. And uh, Mark kind of alluded to this is a possible uh, date, even though it's there's no way to know. Uh, and uh, Doherty makes this claim uh, that uh, it was just prior to the publication of Fantasties. And I think it's because he sees connections of McDonald putting stuff into Fantasties that are Carolian. But there lies the, the problem. He sees them. I'm not sure if other do. others do. Um, more likely dates to offer, offer this important encounter are 1859 and 1860. Um, Carroll owned the first edition of Fantasties, and he also owned and discussed David Elginbrod with MacDonald on the 9th of February, 1863. So if he discussed uh, David Elginbrod then, he most likely discussed Fantasties with him then. That was, I think, uh, MacDonald's major work to that point. Uh, it was a break. It was, uh, now it's considered the first modern fantasy for men and women and a major fantasy work in the tradition. So I, I don't see them not discussing that work. Um, and they discussed David Elginbrod about a month after his publication. And we know this from uh, Carol's uh, diary. And that's one day before we record that he had finished the text of Alice's Adventures in Underground. So these things are running very parallel to one another. Uh, Fantasies, Underground, later Wonderland. The McDonald's were among the first people to read and comment on the manuscript of Alice's Adventures on the Ground. Over a period of years, Carroll probably continued to discuss some of McDonald's work and perhaps his own manuscript or works. So now let's get to the meat of this. Carroll employed components of Chapter 4 of Fantasies when he wrote his Chapter 4 of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. In this Chapter of Fantasies, Carroll uh, McDonald narrates a note of his adventures among the flower fairies. As the hero is leaving the garden flowers and their corresponding fairies, he comes across their wilder, unruly cousins, some of which he describes thus. From the cups of arum lilies, creatures with great heads and grotesque faces, shut up like jack-in-the-box and made grimaces at me. Uh, I don't know if you can begin to see the connection, but anyway, if you, if you don't, I'll, I'll point them out later. Two pages after this, Anoto sees another strange event, beetles forcing glowworms to make contact with earthly pellets. The beetles hunted in couples for these glowworms. They then took the glowworm and held its luminous tail to the dark earthly pellet, when lo, it shot up in the air like a skyrocket. Like a rocket too, it burst in the air and fell in a shower of the most gorgeously colored sparks. Before proceeding with an exposition of how Carol used some of the above characters and incidents from Fantasies, it may prove useful to point towards two of his possible sources, natural botany and some of the bestiaries. First, Carol tells us that he studied natural botany, and he tells us this from the diary from 1856. So pretty early on, he tells us he was studying botany. And he owned over a dozen books on botany and plant lore. His diaries record many visits to botanical gardens and flower shows. Isa Bowman, in Larry Carroll's I Knew Him, notes that Carroll was particularly interested in the folklore of flowers. And Nina Demorova argues that he was well versed in general folklore. Uh, in the letters of Lewis Carroll, there's, there's a letter with a puzzle that relies wholly on obscure botanical names, which Morton Cohen explains as fanciful names of old fashioned flowers and grasses. Second, it is helpful to know that in 1863, Carroll was actively searching for a natural history at the Deanery Library to help him illustrate, uh, illustrate all his adventures underground. A search after such a book has not uncovered anything other than a tome on ornithology. If Carroll was looking for a natural history to help him illustrate a work that included a gryphon, he may have found or been led to exactly such a book, one of the bestiaries. Uh, there's one at, uh, at Oxford, one at Cambridge, 
several at the British Library and the British Museum, and they were available during Carol's time. T.H. Uh, White, who wrote this book on the Beast Theory, is kind of a, a translation of the Beast Theory in Latin, and, uh, and he comments on the Beast Theory. He finds lots of connections to Carol, at least in style and so on. Well, I'm going to go uh, further than, than White and point out that I think it's... Anyway, I'll, I'll get to that and I'll show that he most likely used it. Uh, so there are several beast theories uh, at several locations that Carol would have, been, would have had access to. Uh, now, let's look at the first... So in the Beast Theory, that's one of the, the pictures. And White, that's what kind of tipped him off to looking for Carolian connections, is the Griffin. That if you're looking to picture Griffins, where do you go? Right? You go to the Beast Theory. And here, for some reason, a lot of the Griffins are shown in this weird dance-like pose. In this case, he's dancing, or he has the hold of a pig. There's all kind of symbolism going on because the griffin was often seen, at least by Dante and so on, as Christ. And the pig is often seen as the devil. Okay, so here we have a beast theory griffin. And now, if he did borrow a beast theory, he didn't do that great a job of the, the picturing of it. But there you have this kind of ecstatic dance, which I think, at least the dancing griffin, is, it shows me that there might be a connection. So given that he studied botany and uh, he was interested in plant folklore and all this stuff, we know that Carol's alert to uh, flower names. He knows the flower, their folklore, their meanings, the possibility of punning on them from what I, you know, the letter he puns on. He makes riddles with these names in his letter. So he's, he's very much alert to them. Uh, now let's go to see the sections of Fantastic and attempt to demonstrate how he employed botany, folklore, and the beast here in the first two hours. Another clue. This is Leviathan. Now it's unclear from the Bible what Leviathan is. Sometimes it's a crocodile, alligator, a whale. Well, whoever did this picture of the beast here it seemed to have gone halfway to it. Because it seems to be kind of a whale with scales. The whale stood on Leviathan was the devil. And the whale in the bestiary was supposed to emit a very tempting odor that would welcome little fishes in with, I guess, gently smiling jaws. I don't know, you can tell me. Uh, right, so there in Job, uh, it's understood as a whale. And now, yeah, here, the bestiary is this funny, funny text that gives you animals, and then it uh, gives you write-ups on what they stand for. So here, uh, under whale, we find that when this monster is hungry, it opens its mouth, projects a pleasantly smelling breath. Little fishes are attracted to this savory scent and crawl into the whale's mouth, which the later shut, swallowing them down. Now, I'm going to get into several things of biblical material in this book, because all of these allegories for the most part, are biblical. Now, if Carol's going to use the beast theory, I think it stands to reason that he can't avoid the biblical. And a lot of people say, well, no, Carol would never use the Bible in his books, uh, whatever. Well, look at how he describes Alice in uh, Alice on the Stage, where he, he says he's going to describe the nature of his creation. 
Carol links Alice to the king's daughter of Psalm uh, for, uh, what is that? <laughs> okay, he describes his heroine and Alice on the stage by using biblical language and context. What words thou dream, Alice, in thy foster father's eyes? How shall I, how shall he picture thee, loving and gentle as a fawn, then courteous, courteous to all, high and low, grand and grotesque, king or caterpillar, even as though she were herself a king's daughter and her clothing of broad gold? This is Carol telling us who Alice is. Okay, when we go to the psalm, here's what we get. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is a broad gold. Okay? I think this should dispel the whole idea that Carol wouldn't use biblical language in his analysis. Just this alone. Because he's descri- this is one of the only places where he describes what his creations are like. And this is how he does it. Going directly to the Bible. Back to, to this. So, here so I started from the cups of the iron lilies, creatures with great heads and grotesque faces, shut up like Jack in the Box, have made grimaces at us. That's on page 45. The beetles hunted in couples for the, the glowworms. They then took the glowworms and held their plumous tails with the darkest pellets, when lo, it shut up into the air like a skyrocket. Like a rocket, too, it burst in the air and fell in showers of most gorgeously colored sparks. This is from Wonderland. Uh, so this is Bill. All I know is something comes at me like a jack in the box and up I go up I go like a skyrocket. And oh I missed that one. Now tell me, Pat, what's that in the window? Sure it's an arm, Your Honor. He pronounced it arrow. Okay? The arrow lily. Right? We're talking about two sets of descriptions that use the same terms and they're not regular terms they're kind of weird terms right and they show similar actions after uh, you have a glow worm flying through the air and on the other one you have a lizard flying through the air so now what does it mean well not yet so now we have to go to Lilith. Uh, one thing that my friend John Doherty told me early on, you can't understand Carol unless you read MacDonald. I didn't believe him at first, but it's, it's proven to me very good advice. So now we go to Lilith. A while looking... My point is that all of these narratives add up. They give us more and more clues about what's going on. A while looking little black cat jumped on his Mr. Raven's knee as he spoke. He patted it as one pats a child to make it go to sleep. He seemed to be patting down the sod upon a grave, patting it lovingly. There's a lot of patting going on. Now tell me, Pat. So now, oh, and so Lilith, a complicated text. Here's Lilith. There's six versions of it. Okay? And each one of them gives us clues about the final product. For MacDonald, this is great to have. He is a, an extremely complex writer, and having these other five texts is really helpful. So I'll continue to continue to jump back and forth to the same passage in the Lilith manuscript to give more and more clues about what's going on. So, in Lilith A, the first Lilith manuscript, then after all, you're no sexton. This is a, a vain talking to Raven, only an innkeeper. True for you, he answered, as if he had been an Irishman, and patted the table with his palm, reminding me irresistibly of the way they pat down the turf on the graves in the sweet country churchyard, lovingly coaxingly as if it's com- accompaniment to an inward lullaby. Okay, so, as if he had been an Irishman, Okay. Carol Pat is also an Irishman. Uh, that's already been done by Kelly. He found that out, or at least he wrote about it. 
and it comes from your honor. That's a particularly Irish uh, phrase. And uh, Carroll, in one of his later books, in The Logic, he speaks of Pat to stand for all Irishmen. So he's, he's in that realm. Now, let's see, let me go back to this. So if we place McDonald's and Carol's narratives adjacent to each other, several correlations begin to emerge. The most apparent is, is that uh, they both use Arum Arum, Jack in the Box, and Rocket. And also they split the rocket into sky rocket and rocket also into that. Um, and uh, yeah, we have two creatures flying to the air, a glowworm and a lizard. And their flight both resemble that of rocket. By referring to botanical books, other important connections begin to emerge. Jack in the box is a common name for the plant arum. So the botany starts to give way to this. Um, while rocket is also a name of a plant, most people would probably recognize it as garden rocket, also known as Peruca sativa. Another name for the arum, Jack in the box, is small dragon. A name befitting Bill the Lizard because of the close historical link between lizards and dragons. After making the connection between lizards and dragons, one can begin to analyze McDonald's and Carol's rockets in more detail. The Latin word eruca means both garden rocket and a worm or caterpillar. So all these things are starting to come together, the gel. Um, So now do you see, given this knowledge, why McDonald has his worm flying through the air? In botanical language, it both means a worm and a rocket. So it makes sense that it would be rocket-like in some way. And of course it's fantasy, so you can have this occur. Um, this latter definition of Eruca, as both a rocket and a caterpillar, uh, worm, uh, it's also found in most Latin dictionaries and in several of the beast theories. For instance, Eruca, the caterpillar, is another worm of leaves, as in white, white beast theory. Some of this information is, the, is in the Aberdeen beast theory, housed before 1860 at, at Merritt Hall College, near McDonald's Aberdeen University. The actual beast theory, the Merton College beast theory, along with other related beast theories, housed elsewhere. The rocket Aruka worm connection helps explain parts of McDonald's glowworms association to Fantastic's rockets, while they begin to provide clues towards a better understanding of Carol, Bill the Lizard, and its rocket like flight, as well as its relationship to dragon, worms, and caterpillars. <coughs> By undertaking a review of some of McDonald's other works, it is obvious that he used detailed botanical material, including information on the army for symbolic purposes and playful metaphor. Now we're going to go to David Elgenbrot that Carol tells as he discussed with McDonald. There we find all the wild lovely things were coming up for their month's life of life. Orchids, harlequins, cuckoo plants, wild arums, more properly lords and ladies, that's another name for the arum, were coming and coming slowly for they had not long way to come from the valley of the shadow of death into the land of life. At last a wonder Came up, came up on a whole company of bluebells, not what few would have called bluebells, for the bluebells of Scotland are the single poised harebell, but wild hyacinths, growing in a damp and shady spot, in wonderful luxuriance. They were quite three feet high, with long, graceful, drooping heads hanging down from them, all along one side. The largest and loveliest of bells, one lying close above the other on the lower part, while they parted thinner and thinner as they rose towards the lovely one at the top. How fairies will be ringing the bells in these fairy steeples in the moonlight, said Miss Cameron. Okay. So, later on, I'll present an analogous episode. Carol borrowed exactly this from Sylvia Bruno, where he has Bruno play on these bells. Hence, McDonald and Carroll's episodes use the same botanical terms, arum arum, jack in a box, and rocket, 
as well as the symbols and actions within them, suggesting that the two above literary events are related to each other, and the study benefits from juxtaposition. By examining these similar episodes side by side, readers may begin to construct a more coherent idea of what Carol and MacDonald meant by their use of related characters, symbols, and actions. I will next provide examples of MacDonald's use of very similar episodes in the above in his Lilith manuscript. So I already went through uh, this stuff, right? The, the stuff from Lilith. So both of the above quotations, this stuff here, and the corresponding instances in the other four Lilith manuscripts, Lilith C, C, D, and E, are supplemented by the information that this Irish family Mr. Raven is also a gardener. Near the end of the story, when instructing Dane on the procedures regarding where to bury Lilith's severed hand, another thing that they share, in Lilith, they, they cut off Lilith's hand. And remember what Okay, I might as well read this whole thing. Alice suddenly spread her hand and made a snatch in the air. She did not get hold of anything, but she heard a little shriek. Shrieks are very much associated with mandrakes, and, and I'm getting to the <laughs> topic of the paper. Uh, but anyway, she heard a little shriek and a fall, and a crash of broken glass, from which she concluded that it was just possible the rabbit had fallen into a cucumber frame or something of the sort. Next came an angry voice, the rabbit. Pat, Pat, where are you? And then a voice she had never heard before. Sure, then I'm here. Digging for apples, Your Honor. Okay. Digging for apples. This has caused some consternation among scholars. What, what does that mean, digging for apples? Uh, and then the rabbit. Digging for apples, indeed, said the rabbit angrily. Here, come and help me out of this. Sounds a more broken glass. Now tell me, Pat, what's that in the window? Sure, it's an arm, Your Honor. He pronounced it arm. An arm, you goose. Whoever saw one that size? Why, it fills the whole window. Sure it does, Your Honor, but it's an art for all that. Well, it's got no business there. At any rate, go and take it away. So I think there's another connection where you're severing, or at least a rabbit wants... I mean, it's pretty ironic that most times you carry a, a rabbit's paw around for luck, and the rabbit is calling for Alice's arm, our own, to be taken away. In Lilith, MacDonald covertly, uh, uh, refers covertly to the above underlined episode, which is shown earlier as self refers back to Fantasi. He uses the word Pat not as a proper noun but as a verb, and he, he links his gardener to Carol's Irish gardener, Pat, by referring Mr. Raven's answering being with an Irish idiom, true for you. And this can be found in Partridge's catchphrase. As if he had been an Irishman, both authors, authors also make reference to the removal of a female limb, although MacDonald restricts himself to a hand instead of a full arm. MacDonald's gardener, who uses an Irish idiom, like Harold's Irish gardener, also calls himself a farmer and a seller. This implies that some of the beautiful things he digs up are and stores are roots. On the other hand, Harold's Irish gardener claims that he's digging for apples. These apples have occasioned some scholarly discussion. Two possible, pot two possible potatoes, the French pomme de terre and the Irish apple, have been put forward to account for the underground nature of these apples. The lack of other French references in this episode, the lack of a possible rationale for the use of the anglicized translation of a French potato, the fact that potatoes are not harvested at the beginning of May, the time when the story occurs, as I will soon show, this is an important botanical factor for Carol. If you can't harvest potatoes at this time, Carol would not have included, and we have him on record pointing out inconsistencies exactly like this. Uh, so there's uh, the time is all wrong for picking apples or potatoes. And the lack of a possible explanation for the rabbit's disapproval of Pat's apple digging, however, tend to point against the French interpretation, while the last two reasons direct us away from an Irish apple. That's not to say that either reading of the apples as potatoes is wrong, only that they don't seem to explain very much. And if, and if accepted, they give rise to an important contradiction within the text which I will show later is important for Carol. These botanical things have to be straight. And we know that Carol had a rage for order, and this kind of thing really bugged them to have the wrong information. Uh, okay, so what kind of apple is this? 
Because angel apples do not grow underground as roots do, it seems logical to search for another plant no known as an apple, which does grow below the surface, which may be dug in May, and whose digging may cause upset. The only apple that seems to fit these preliminary requirements is the mandrake, also known as love apple. Mandrake, the distinctive root of the mandrake, which from, to many eyes resembles a human figure, was one of the most valued ingredients of medieval medicine, and it was credited with all manner of magical properties. The somewhat grotesque root was used in many witches' brews and was alleged to have various soporic, aphrodisiac, and purgative powers. The root does, in fact, contain an alkaloid that can suppress pain and promote sleep. The English later nicknamed the plant the love apple. Now, we'll start getting into the folklore of the mandrake, which is pretty dark stuff. Um, there was all kinds of really crazy beliefs around uh, mandrakes. <coughs> so here's how you pick the mandrake. Care must be taken in pulling up the root of the mandrake, and the root leaves the soil and sits to utter a terrible shriek, which is itself enough to kill or drive any living thing, uh, to drive any living thing mad. Now, so that's one of the things associated with the mandrake. Uh, and, okay, people knew the Bible stories from Genesis of Rachel and Leah and the mandrake, so the large roots of the native breed only did service to the exotic, expensive roots of the mandrake are. So the English, you couldn't grow that the mandrake in England, but there was something fairly similar, so they just translated all that they knew about the mandrake onto the, the breed. Uh, now... I keep jumping between the two, so I'm going to try to get caught up. This information <coughs> begins to help to elucidate parts of Carroll's botanical episode by identifying the nature of the apple's padded digging, supplying a consistent rationale for the time of year they were unearthed, and providing reasons for the rabbit's angry response to his gardener's perhaps questionable activity. And definitely mandrake could be picked in spring. That's one was even called, I think, spring mandrake because that's when they were harvested. The botanical arum arum that Pat mentions was known primarily, uh, the botanical arum arum that Pat mentions was known primarily as a mandrake in Yorkshire. Okay, now they, again we start get, getting a lot of jelly. So the arum is known as a mandrake in Yorkshire. That's where Carol was raised. Uh, to which locality an 11 year old Carol moved in 1843. Because the true mandrake is rare to Britain, another plant at home. Okay. Uh, now, the Brienne is in, is in the Cucur Vitae family of plants. So it is no surprise that the common name for this mandrake is cucumber, the cucumber frame. It seems that these mandrakes have been so called cucumbers for a very long time, while the biblical mandrake has been called a mandrake apple, at least as far back as 1603. Look at uh, OED under apple or mandrake. Thus, these broody apples begin to explain why Pat is digging in the month of May, why the rabbit may be upset, as well as to account for the wonder of cucumber. The rabbit's probably <coughs> upset, as most people would be upset for anybody digging mandrakes around them because that scream is supposed to drive you mad or kill you on the spot. Um, now, due to the belief that aphrodisiac and fertilizing attributes of these similar plants are on mandrakes and briony, it is no wonder that Carol included several references to them in the most sexualized of his Wonderland episodes. I guess it's from Dogger. <coughs> Given Carol's botanical studies and interest in the meaning of words, including slang, he probably knew that an arum is a jack in a box, and perhaps that this latter is all slang is an old slang term meaning for a child in the mother's womb that can be found in growth. Even without considering the overtly sexual fertility connotations of the related plants mentioned above, but perhaps prompted by a phallic lizard going down a chimney towards a fetal position, Alice, Donald Rackham states this about Carol's underground illustration, illustration of Alice in the rabbit's house. <laughs> Carol's Alice in her fetal position, so horribly crowded in that womb, she cannot escape, has a dreamy look of terrible sad acceptance. So several people have already noticed that this is a highly sexualized episode of Wonderland. 
And no wonder. Uh, Mandrake was the most aphrodisiac, aphrodisiacal plant of the time. And through all kinds of different, not only through the Vistier, but through the Bible, uh, it's all about the fertility aspects of Mandrake. The similar allusions and sheer connections between McDonald's and Carroll's narrative do not stop there. Had the Irish gardener who identifies himself with the rabbit as a digger of Mandrake, is ordered to remove the Aram Aram, while Mr. Raven, the Irish sounding Paddy Gardener, severs little stand, and then orders Lane to bury it. These related reference to the severed arm and hand might be further explained by taking note of another aspect of the folklore of the Mandrake, that of the hand of glory. So now we're getting yeah, into the real dark stuff about Mandrake. A charm made from the dried or pickled hand of a dead man, preferably a criminal hanged in the on the gallows of Western European, specifically Northern English beliefs. Many of the beliefs about the hand of glory are explained by its etymology. It is undoubtedly a derivative of the French main de gloire, or mandragora, mandragora, the mandrake. This would explain the specific reference to the hanged man as the mandrake is known to be found under gallows, the growth germinating from the seed of the dead man. So that's some of the folklore is that whenever particularly murders are hung, the, the spinal cord would break and some of them would get erections and ejaculate. And from that ejaculate would grow the, the plant. So it's fertility, darkness, uh, yeah, it's crazy stuff. Carol would have encountered an account of the mandibular, which sometimes included not only the hand, but a large part of the arm, as the mandragora in Richard Kench's English Past and Present, one of the author's etymology books he was studying or planned to study in 1855, or in a literary account of the Hand of Glory in the widely available The Anglesey Legend, a book he owned that used as a model for parts of his rectory umbrella. He may also have heard of some of the popular tales about the Hand of Glory while living in Yorkshire. At least one famous story, that is the use of the Hand of Glory in the innkeeping Anderson family in 1797 from the Yorkshire, from Yorkshire. So the hand of glory, they would take this pickled hand, thieves would take this pickled hand, light up a, a candle on it, and break into houses, thinking that the hand of glory would not allow anybody to wake in that house. So they had free, free reign, free reign to sack the place. Of course, probably didn't work. But they're associating several things here. The hand of glory as a sleeping. Oh yeah, they used to give um, a way back, way back. Also, as if you needed to uh, get a limb cut, it would put you out so much so that if you took too much, it would kill you. But it would put you out uh, into such a coma that most times people thought that you were dead. Um, so it's so anyway. The way that it worked its way into the folklore was well, if it can do that, maybe then this hand can put the people in the house to sleep. And I'm going to get into the light sources of the, the mandrake later on. Maybe I'll explain it now. The, the mandrake was known as a light source because they would attract glowworms for some reason. I don't know why. And it was thought that as you got closer, it would run away from you. Well, this, this makes some sense. As you're getting closer, the, the glowworms are not going to shine anymore. And then you'd see probably another one that was shining. So it looked as though it was running away from it. Anyway, there are lots of light things associated with mandrakes. So there again, the thieves took these two things and made it into this wild, and they believed it. Oh, and they were very expensive. Uh, so there are very few of them. And the books down there, if people are interested, there's an actual picture of one. Uh, If you want to gather the mandrake because of its great health-giving qualities, you shall gather it in this wise. It shines at night like a lamp, and when you see it, mark it run quickly with iron, lest it escape you. For so strong is its power in it that, it see, that if it sees an unclean man coming to it, it runs away. So for this reason, mark it round with iron and dig around it, taking care that you do not touch it with the iron, but remove the earth from it with the utmost care, with an ivory stick. And when you have seen the foot of the plant and its hand, 
Then you shall at once bind the plant with a new rope and you shall tie the same round the neck of a hungry dog and in front of it, in front of it place food at a little distance. Okay, so we're getting more into this kind of, yeah, the folklore of it is it's a very dangerous plant that was often associated with witches but going all the way back to Circe. Some people have thought it was Molly from the Iliad, uh, I mean the Odyssey, uh, and also peony or anyway, anything related to kind of very strong drugs. Uh, but yeah, you have to be very careful and not, you can't touch it, at least not until it's out of the ground, and you need a dog. I want some, because it would kill whoever pulled it, this is the way to get around that. You tie a rope to a dog, you tie the rope to the plant, and then you run away and you throw food, and the dog supposedly will, will follow you, or the food, and there it is. And the dog must die. Either it dies right there on its own, or you have to kill it. Huh. Now, okay, so now let's go back a little bit to something that this is the kind of thing that Carol does, I was telling you before, that uh, he's very bothered by things, botanical things, not matching up. So here's what he tells uh, Fern. You have drawn bluebells, which grow singly, not harebells, which grow five or six together, along the lower side of a single stalk. Uh, and then he, he sends his own illustration of harebells so that he gets it right. <coughs> and it's too bad we don't have letters between him and uh, Antonio. So we have to do with his other illustrators that we have a little more information to see what kind of man he was with his illustrators, how controlling he was or how exact he wanted to be. Uh, okay. Tent in Wonderland and Underground. Alice put, picks up a jack-in-the-box, then her arm arm reaches for the elusive rabbit while he gives out a shriek before he ends up in the cucumber frame. And later on, when she reaches there again, there are two more shrieks. In this episode, several characters and objects assume the name and attributes of Mandarin. Moreover, Carol's not only using, but also, as I will soon show what's the case with McDonald's, he's playing with some of the general beliefs and superstition, superstitious practices surrounding these magical plants. For instance, instead of a, of a human severing the paw of a rabbit, he uses an arm arm mandrake or at the top of the here we have the rabbit calling for the removal of our mandrake hand. Similarly, when MacDonald and Mr. Raven sever Lily's hand directly after which action she falls asleep, he is directly reversing some of the accepted folk folklore, because the mandrake apple held in the hand when going to bed was recommended to induce sleep. So it's associated with sleep, you can't sleep, hold some mandrake before going to bed. Um, in the illustrations for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, there's at least one arrow plant depicted in the picture of Alice holding the baby pig. Um, and in some ways it's a weird mixture of two plants. It's an arum, it's a leaf of an arum, and it's for sure an arum, and then there's a foxglove that seems to be growing out of it. And the foxglove again is another very poisonous, interesting plant all of its own. Um, so now, okay, we'll go back to this. One of the reasons for Carol instructing Fermi's death is because his fairy child, Bruno, is meant to play music upon these harebells. Thus, the above demonstrates that small botanical details are important for Carol in his book, and that he borrowed some of the exact botany and fairy settings from McDonald's dated Elginbrook. Carol's interaction with Fermi's may also indirectly elucidate how the arms and Tennille's illustration probably introduced into Wonderland to supplement the disguised arm arm in the text. Pat's digging for apples, mandrake, Alice's arm arm grasping an invasive shrieking rabbit and later shrieking Pat, both of whom fall into cucumber frame, and the arm illustration are direct references to mandrake. However, Carol refers to this plant by name in Mishmash, in its early poem, Blood. In this poem, which I give a part of the fourth on the two last answers. Okay. So he's he seems to be, at the very least, concerned for their mandrakes don't seem to be uh, foreign to him. He, uh, 
to think you know some of the <coughs> some of the folklore. The superstitions associated with manners may begin to help explain other parts of McDonald's Lilith, which in turn may help elucidate relevant parts of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Fantasy. They may help explain why Raven Adam emphatically warns Mara of danger when she attempts to take to touch Lilith's amputated hand, why Mara twice refuses to touch the severed hand in every version of the book, but instead carries it in the lap of her robe, and the reason for digging such a large hole, such a large hole to bury the hand. Um, moreover, McDonald's emphasis on a spade, a word meaning both a shovel and a sword, as a necessary implement with which to sever and bury Lilith's hand may point to his knowledge of a sword as a required tool in the inertia of Mandrake. Because these Wonderland and Little Lilith episodes use parts of Chapter 4 of Fantasy, it is worth looking back in this chapter for other possible connections. It is a pair of beetles resembling awkward elephant calves. That's how he describes those beetles that. Uh, Remember, they were hunting for the glowworm to put to the earthy village to get the flight? Okay, so he describes them as awkward elephant calves that hunt for glowworms, which they put to the earthy village, leading to fiery outbursts. The Beast Theory, a book of beasts, includes the translation of a passage, and among others, the Aberdeen Beast Theory and the Ashmore Beast Theory. Oh, and here's a, here's a arum plant. This is an arum leaf. Uh, that's definitely not part of an arm plant. That's the, and in, uh, in the nursery Alice, he tells us that this plant is a foxglove. He goes out of his way to tell us that it's a foxglove. Okay, now okay. So, here's what the beast theory tells us. There is an animal called an elephant, which has no desire to copulate. If one of them wants to have a baby, he goes eastward towards paradise. And there is a tree, a tree there called Mandragora, and he goes with his wife. She first takes up the tree and they give some to her spouse. When they munch it up, it seduces them, and she immediately conceives in her womb. Now, I hope you start seeing the connections here. Now, this ties the mandrake directly to the apple. It's the apple that uh, introduces knowledge of sexual things to Adam and Eve. Now here's how it's, uh, the allegory is explained as in. Now the elephant and his wife represent Adam and Eve. For when they were pleasing to God before their provocation in the flesh, they knew nothing about population, nor had they knowledge of sin. When, however, the wife ate of the tree of knowledge, which is what the mandragora means, and gave one of the fruits to her man, she was immediately made a wanderer, and they had to clear out of paradise on account of it. That's on the white piece here. Uh, okay. So, when McDonald says that the couple of beetles resemble elephant calves, and they are in this Edenic scene, I think that's kind of what he's getting at here. It's this complicated going back to Edenic talk as found in the Beast Theory. Now in Lilith, we get more information. So, uh, okay. some of this folklore of uh, an Edenic, this kind of stuff, some of this folklore is supported in the original Hebrew word Yudaim, usually translated as mandrake or love apples in the Bible. The folklore of these ancient narratives makes the Mandrake apple link explicit and may begin to give an identic dimension to McDonald's Fairyland and Carol's Wonderland. While it seems to begin to account for McDonald's strange description of his beetles resembling elephant calves. Drawing upon some of the above insights as well as additional information, we may return to McDonald's fantasy. The name Adam derives from Adama, or Earth. Therefore, McDonald's beetles that resemble an end of an elephant couple as Adam and Eve search for glowworms associated with Mandrake with which they touch the earth Adam palette and end up with an outburst of sparks of every variety and hue. It is clear that it is unclear what it is that actually becomes airborne in fantasy. Is it the glowworm, the earth palette, or something different? It's most likely the glowworm, given that Aruka means rocket, and it also means worm. Uh, Carol, in his Wonderland uh, 
Carol, who, like his Wonderland duck, figures it must be either a frog or a worm, seems to lean towards the ladder, interpreting MacDonald's hit rocket as a small dragon, worm, or flying lizard. Carol and MacDonald try to figure it is their Ruka or warm rocket that takes flight. In chapter 40 of Lilith, as Dane, the leopardess Mara, has children and two elephants bearing Lilith, the elephants come back in Lilith as real elephants. They're not, they're not beetles anymore. Uh, so these two elephants bearing Lilith are crossing the hellish swamp of the Bad Burrow. They encounter long billed heads shooting out of the earth. Each reminiscent of the Fantastic gnomes or fairies, goblin fairies who inhabit the ground and whose heads shot up from the arms, following the episode of these long-billed heads, the troop encounters a long neck with the head of a corpse that resembles a Stygian lily, or a hellish water lily, topped by a grotesque head with a gaping mouth that fully recalls the gnomes or fairy goblins who inhabit the ground. Atop the arm lilies in Fantasy, McDonald begins to describe this episode of Lilith by mentioning that the leopardess had jumped twice at bodiless heads yet could not reach them because they buried themselves in the ground. Similar incidents continue to recall components of Fantastic and Wonderland. Okay. So here's how he describes. Almost under our feet shot up the head of an enormous snake with lamping wallowing glare in its eyes. Again, the leopardess rushed to the attack but found nothing. At a third monster, she darted with started with light fury and light failure, then suddenly ceased to heed the phantom horde. We were almost over when between us and the border of the basin arose a long neck, on the top of which, like the blossom of some Stygian lily, sat what seemed the head of a corpse, its mouth half open and full of canine teeth. I went on. It retreated. It grew aside. The Lady Mara stepped on the firm land, but the leopardess between us roused one mo once more, turned and flew at the throat of the terror. I saw the leopardess and the snake monster uh, convolved in a cloud of dust, in darkness hidden. So now, another sea raven turned and walked slowly away with his feet towards the ground. All at once he pounced on a spot, throwing the whole weight of his body on his bill, and for some moments dug vigorously. Then with a flutter of wings he threw back his head and something shot from his bill and cast high in the air. The something opened into a soft radiance. So I'm claiming here that in Lilith, he's going back to that whole bill flying through the air. He, again, they change the, the, the words around, but they're still using, I mean, they change the meanings of the words, but they're still using the same, same word. Now here's, uh, that was from, that was from Lilith, from Lilith B. Mr. Raven turned and walked away with his beak pointing to the ground as if it were looking for something among the roots. He all at once pounced upon a spot a quarter or two away from him and dug his bill into it. For a moment or two he went digging, then suddenly threw up his bill in the air, and something from it flew up higher still, then burst into a soft, gentle break. Okay. So, now let's see what the panther is doing in all of this. Because remember when they're crossing the hellish burrow? They're safe. And yet the panther is roused and goes after this, this, uh, so here, okay. Uh, see it had retreated, I went on it retreated, then drew aside. The Lady Mara stepped on the firm land, but the leopard is between us, roused once more, turned and flew at the throat of the terror. And this, uh, and this seems to be the, the death of the, the, the leopard, the leopardess. In the, the least here, this is what we get. There is an animal called the panther, which has a truly variegated color and it is most beautiful and excessively kind. Physiologist says that the only animal which he considers an enemy is the dragon. When a panther has died and is full up, it hides away in its own den and goes to sleep. After three days, it wakes up again and emits a loud belch, and there comes a very sweet smell from its mouth, like the smell of all spice. The dragon only hearing the sound flees into caves off the earth, being smitten with fear. Okay, what does it mean? 
the true panther, our Lord Jesus Christ, snatched us from the power of the dragon devil on descending from the heavens. He associated us with himself as sons by his incarnation, accepting all and gave gifts to men, leading captivity captive. Dying, he reposed in the den tomb and descended into hell, there binding the great dragon. But on the third day he rose from sleep and emitted a mighty noise, breathing sweetness. Okay. So, the true panther is our Lord Jesus. So there again we're in very religious talk about how our supposed salvation occurs. And here it's put in terms of the panther being Jesus. It goes after uh, the dragon, the devil. He has to descend into the earth for three days to come up again triumphant. Now, so that seems to be the reason why McDonald must have the, the, leper, the leopardess go after this monster and then they both descend into the, the hellish burrow as they called it. Okay. <laughs> Um, here's a, a picture of how it was done, and here's a, if you go and see a lot of uh, the, the coffin tops of uh, knights and so on, they'll often be pictured with their feet, even the one here at the, at the cathedral, with their feet on a dog or a lion. Now McDonald has leopard it. But he's going back somehow that's related to this. And I guess the leopardess would pull you out of the earth back into life. I take it. That's just my own kind of understanding of what's going on. Why did this why does this go to all kinds of other places? Uh, yeah. Now quickly then I'll wrap up. McDonald has Lilith's hand severed. But in one of the, I think it's one, maybe two, of the narrative, he confuses her hand with her head. So it, he says, like, hold her arm in your left hand, and in both hands hold her head, even though that's never been severed. The reason for that is in Christianity, <coughs> when the Christians came upon, came upon this stuff and they saw just how powerful the, the drug was and this whole belief in the, in the mandrake was, they incorporated it into their own belief and they thought that humanity was the mandrake and that Jesus at the end of time would come and that would be the head, the logos placed on the mandrake and that would signal the end of, the end of time and people's salvation. <coughs> so I think given everything that I've stated with the Edenic nature of Carol and MacDonald in, in these texts, that's what they're kind of getting at. It's retelling the our history, in a way, of the biblical history, anyway, of the devil flying through the air, falling, because Bill fall is, yeah, part of the narrative. <coughs> and this whole idea that the mandrake somehow was recuperated as a Christian symbol, which later on would be put back, not necessarily as an arm, but as a head, and then this would be the sign for the end of time, and... I guess our success in yeah, having come through the trials and tribulation and now there's the logos with Jesus and I guess we're all going to have
Uh, so this last one was, was, was your how do we explore your, um, you're talking about the work and the flying work, and especially in the context of the manuscripts, which I agree, like, they're absolutely crucial for understanding it. Uh, one of the annotations you make to the actual manuscript, and I don't think that's printed in the printed version of the manuscript, is the observation that the work in the original version is a bookworm. And she says it's a bookworm, and I would have thought the bookworm has a um, certain connection with the work there, but also the bookworm we're talking about is a different dimension to which it's talking in. Which is then, she says, just as well as Raven in his um, consideration of the question says, I'm, it's the same job. Um, I'm, I'm a librarian, but I'm also a sexer. I'm just turning the bookworm into side piece. Side piece, of course, being box like as well as the soul. Mm -hmm. And the transformation, the spiritual transformation, of course, raised in a further dimension. It's quite interesting when you're talking about death and dreaming on the one hand, but also on the symbolic level of the different creatures that are connecting to sort of higher symbolic spirits or the Dora, or more specifically connecting Sarah. And you were talking about the different dimensions, and I thought it's potentially there, potentially two different dimensions. Can I add something? Yeah. I didn't have time, but Blake is very much involved in all of this. Yeah, right? yeah. And uh, for Blake, uh, he goes back to this uh, the worm, the chrysalis, notice, Chris yeah. Alice. Yeah. Chris Alice, yeah. she's dreaming, and then the butterfly. <coughs> Later, Alice gets replaced by Sylvie, from Silk. And Silk means all three states. It means the worm, the pupa, and the butterfly. So that's why there's this jump to now uh, between Heron. She doesn't go back to Alice uh, because she's in some ways she's stuck in that dreaming state. I don't know. I guess we don't get to find out what happened, but uh, given Alice's life, yeah, I don't think she ever woke up the butterfly that Carol thought she was going to wake up. Uh, and uh, for Blake, it's these three symbols that go way back. The the Greeks saw this yeah, as the psyche that. You were supposedly awakened to, and then you could see everything now. You're above it. You are. <coughs> but yeah, these three stages are very, very uh, important. And he definitely uses, in my opinion anyway, and I think I can prove it, that he used uh, the gates of paradise in Alice. And he uses the same symbolism uh, throughout. And some of the pictures look very much like they go together from uh, the gates of paradise. And I'll uh, have a look, and especially of uh, a worm overlooking a sleeping child, which I think is supposed to be the pupa. And pupa, by the way, means little girl and a chrysalis. Um, yeah, so in terms of kind of dreaming and the uh, romantic combination of being, being in death, I think that that movement of the, the spirit um, is definitely an important one in the economy. Because, yeah, I think. Um, you said the movement in 1860 was um, physiological, psychologic, and the kind of the issue that was was what the speech of the soul was in the mind, because it wasn't a physical thing. You know, physiological psychology is supposed to explain every function of the mind. Um, the analogy of being at large, it almost does become a physical thing because between waking then and, and being dreamed, you can have. <laughs> yeah, the dream state where um, the person you're physically moving, you're enacting a dream, but um, their soul or their mind is the object of the death. So, yeah. So, so I'm not sure there's anything to add because Francisca mentions it by name. Well, he did not mention it. Yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, Carol would have been aware of. 
rather than the, the well, there material. Was a, there was power. actually makes a reference to the Times mm -hmm. Magazine and the Mirror. It, it was called the Fourth, but of course, in the manuscript, it's still the Fourth, mm -hmm. in the early manuscript, it's the Fourth Dimension, the Eureka Page, but this is the one with the Seventh Dimension. Oh, yeah. um, so the Eureka Page, when it's got into the Jane Champlain, um, the Fourth Dimension at one point referred to it as the Fourth Dimension, and that's the third term that my brother actually used for the Fourth Dimension in the manuscript. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I don't read the time like that, please forgive me. It would be apt so much to put in the font size from font to read it in person. <laughs> <laughs> we must remember, too, that some of the words that he sings up turn into books and stuff. Again, like kind of like in the Big Theory, a character can be several things, and several things can be characters. Like every, there's such an inter interchange of here. You have Alice being an Arum, and yet she seems to be grabbing a hold of Mandrake. But she herself is a mandrake. You just remove her hand, just like MacDonald has Lilith's hand, which is a mandrake. So, I mean, it's very, very fluid. What? But yeah, in this case, you can have the book form be the the worm, and also the book. Well, it's interesting because that's one of the bits that MacDonald deletes in the final version. That the the returning book runs into title changes, deleted from the final version. But it's quite interesting because he he deletes a lot of stuff and sticks things in that we now think of as an integral part of the story. But mm -hmm. actually, really, just added at the very very mm -hmm. last minute. Then, uh, you know, like for instance, the Novalis quotation I gave was only added in one of the very 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 last um, versions. And it's literally he's already writes the end like three times when he sticks in it underneath. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting that we have those sort of rows of uncommon text that we can mm -hmm. add. Jump on a little plug back. Um, I'll be speaking Wednesday on answering the riddle, and you'll see there that Mr. Raven is central to that, to the why is the raven like a writing desk. Where's that? Where's the Where? Uh, the oh. Mark Where's Stone. The library library? Mm -hmm. Arbor Christian. Arbor Christian, yeah. yeah. So if you want to know the, the answer to the <laughs> riddle, or at least a, a pretty good answer to it, come to the lecture and... Uh, and you'll get the answer corroborated by McDonald, which I think is very important. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question um, that I'll quite find out uh, whether it was true that um, Rose MacDonald and Carol were in a music therapy group discussing Carol's speech therapy. And um, in the first note of the on Doctor Who score, I refer to some I could imagine that that was true, and they might in fact share in thinking of Mandrake and other. Is that the whole thing? Dougherty had this idea that at least McDonald was in this horse cult or something like that. I, I don't know what that is, or. Sorry, did you say horse? Horse, yeah. As in the back of the Northman, where mm -hmm. the woman is a horse. and There were, there were old horse cults where uh, women were, would wear yeah. horse masks. <laughs> But I don't know if they were around in the Victorian times. I mean, I'm talking. That's a very fluid thing, really. Mm -hmm. This could be an animal, and that it was kind of a cricket. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would be cults per se, but McDonald and Carol. I think I, I think it doesn't. It doesn't ring that. Mm -hmm. that I don't think Carol would be involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. No, it's not. 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 It's Right? Why were they there at all? And a lion and a dog in this scene? And, but well, then we're not in that realm of religious people, symbolism. People yeah. used to say that the lion had at least a crusade. That's what I think. But that is not true, because I've checked with the expert on armor and the depiction of it on tune, Toby Catlett, at the Wallace Collection. And he didn't seem to know. But he's a very concrete person. He's fascinated by the shape of the rivet and so on, on the armor. So it may be beyond his remit. But I, there are various theories, but I'm not sure it's been proven. MacDonald and Lilith as the panther sit at the bottom of, I believe it's Lilith's feet. 
And then now we know that the Panther is Jesus. <laughs> so that tells me something, that at the end of time, when Lilith is repented or whatever comes around, that she will be pulled as a Madonna belief and everybody would be saved. So even Lilith and even the devil. So that I guess Jesus would lift everybody up. And so I think that's what the Panther is doing at the feast. Would, would that be a connection to the Phyllis then, the Adlana Jesus, and the Panther is Jesus? Maybe, maybe. I mean, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's it's a very long explanation, mm -hmm. but uh, for some of the research that I've done, what is the devil? He is with his sweet breath. He's tempting all of these young children to sin, and then you have God with his sweet breath bringing them out. And so I think that's what what is doing in why he twice gets you know parodied in Wonderland and later in Silvia Runa. And so does so does Madonna. They both despise Watt. And I think they're right. He was a very negative person. Question from Alan Anthony. It is it isn't a question. Would I be allowed just a minute to tell people why I prompted this? Oh. Yeah, but, uh, can we do it at the end yeah, of the course, yeah. 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 I'm not approaching this from an academic in this book at all. I was intrigued by one of the really sort of detailed connections you were making, I think. Do you think they were all done consciously, or do you think a lot of this is now us looking at it and sort of almost seeing, seeing links that maybe, I'm not saying we're not there, weren't necessarily done totally consciously? I say that a man like Carol, who he is so ordered in everything else, everything else, and given that McDonald's doing the same thing, I don't think there's a lot of room to say that this somehow snuck up with him. Uh, my thesis is that this man is almost like Dante, sticking everything that he knows into these texts to describe everything. And one more thing, it's about the wonder, I think. Wonderland. We're supposed to be wonder, or as we, the sense of wonder is what attracts us. It's that not knowing, but thinking that we may know, or knowing some of it. And I think that's what makes the books what they are. Wonderful, beautiful, philosophical treatises of <coughs> manuscripts. <coughs> I'd just like to thank Haley for her um, talk, because uh, back in 80, uh, 80, 1982, uh, he put the stones of, of this tower in Pope's corner. Can you imagine the discussion? What words should go on that tomb? And what words did? I better get the right one. Is all our life then but a dream? And I've been, you know, for years I've been such a torture thinking, did we, did we choose it? Absolutely. You're so <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I think Ben's going to give us something. If anybody has any questions for later on, just come around.